find you well this sabbath uh uh i'm so excited to be in church after a very long while uh hopefully all of us will, will be blessed allow me to remove my mask and we let us pray uh, our father word in heaven we are so thankful for the sabbath rest we're thankful that we can lay down all our tools we can put our mind to rest knowing that you are taking over of our lives so this morning i pray father that as we are about to share your word that all glory and honor be returned unto you and may you speak to our hearts speak to our souls and more so may you give us life through the breath of the word i pray all this in jesus name amen um this morning we are using the book of Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6 verse number 9, that is our theme verse for the day, Galatians chapter 6 verse number 9, I'm going to read, let us not be weary in doing well or in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, I'm going to read again, in your hearing, I'm reading from the King James Version. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Um, there's something very interesting about um, this particular verse. It's coming from, the, from a book written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, Paul is a very interesting character in that um, he was persecuting Christians, but he meets God on his way to Damascus and he repents. And here he is now encouraging other Christians. So just before we get into the word, there are a few things that I want us to, uh, to learn uh, before I give you a topic. Uh, the word weary can be classified as an adjective. It's an adjective. So uh, the word weary in this particular verse is an adjective. An adjective is a word that describes, right, or modifies the meaning of a noun. An adjective is a word that describes or defines or modifies a noun. So, um, in simple terms, an adjective tells us more about a noun. It gives us more information about a noun. For example, if you meet a, a boy, right, and you are trying to give somebody a description, said, I met a big boy. It means you are giving more information about a noun of the boy. This boy is big, which might mean he has more weight, he has better body built. That is what an adjective is all about. So the word weary in this particular verse is a noun that is describing, is an adjective rather, that is describing the activity that is being talked about in this particular verse. It says, do not be weary in doing good, which means the weariness 
is being referred to people who are doing something. Hopefully you are getting it. You cannot be weary when you are not doing anything, unfortunately. So this particular verse is talking to Christians who are up to something. Well, let me hasten to say, it's very unfortunate, probably because of this pandemic that is among us, that a lot of Christians are not doing even anything. So this verse does not affect them anyway. I would encourage each and every one of us this morning that we be up to something, at least so that this particular verse becomes applicable in our day to day living. Uh, well, um, anyway, I, 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 will, I will go on to, 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 to say, uh, to be in a position of being weary or to be a, a subject to this verse, it simply means we are in a position of being encouraged, right? We are being encouraged to continue to do something, to be up to something. Anyway, for our application of, uh, of today's theme, which is do not be weary. Do not be weary is our, our theme for the day. So um, let's open our Bibles to the book of um, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse number 19 to about 27. 19 to about 27. Let's not forget our theme is be not weary. Be not weary. Um, verse number 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought to them the magistrates saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Right? I will read that again. These men do exceedingly trouble our city. Verse 21. And teach customs which are not lawful to us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together again against them. And the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded them to beat them. Verse 23, and they had laid many stripes, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their fist fast in the stock. And at midnight, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Um, when the Spirit was upon Paul and Silas, they went on a mission to preach the word. And when they went to this particular city, and they were busy ushering people unto God through the gospel, praying, preaching, and many people were, 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 were turning to salvation through the gospel or through the work of Paul, of Paul and Silas. It is said that uh, they met a certain lady who was possessed with a, an evil spirit or an unclean spirit, and they cast out this demon, right, of which I would classify those acts as uh, good works. Yes, they are good works. We would classify those as good works, right? And we would expect the whole city to be happy that somebody has been delivered. But unfortunately, or fortunately in the eyes uh, uh, of Paul and Silas, they were persecuted for doing good works. And as a Christian, I would say sometimes as we do good works, we should expect persecution. Or oh, not everyone is happy because of the good works that we, we will be doing. Um, so I would still encourage us to continue doing those good works besides the persecution. Not only were they persecuted, verse number, verse number, number, number 22 says, the multitude rose against Paul and Silas and they began to beat them, right? 
Not only were they persecuted by words, right? They were beaten. So it's not enough for you to be a Christian and be persecuted by words. At some point, they become physical or the world becomes physical and they start beating you. And if I was in Paul's shoes, I'm sure after hearing them scorning me or abusing me verbally, I would run away. But Paul and Silas continued doing good and they were taken and beaten. Verse number 23 says, the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded them to beat them. Uh, it's not so easy to think that you are working for Christ and get persecuted. And people even rent their clothes so that you get more beating. You know, it's very, very, very funny a story. And when they were laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. As if it was not enough, there was verbal abuse, firstly, and there was physical abuse through beating. They were thrown into the prison, or the people or the magistrate decided to throw them into, into prison, right? When they were thrown into prison, follow me closely, when they were thrown into prison, right, um, they were not only put in prison. The Bible says here in verse number 23, they, char they charged the jailer to keep them safely. Not only that, this gentleman or this jailer took them into prison, right? Not only prison, but into an inner prison. That's what verse number 24 says. And not only that, they were, their feet were fast into the, into the stock. Um, but the Bible says in verse number 25, which will be our main stay in this presentation. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners had them, and the prisoners had them. Well, um, I want to give you a certain picture of these two men. Physically abused verbally abused. Obviously, these two men were in deep pain. I'm sure we can all agree uh, being beaten by the whole city and by people who are very angry for taking away their source of income. It simply means their backs were so raw and the pain and, and the wounds of being beaten were oozing with blood. But not only that, uh, I'm sure the we all know the environment that is in the prison. Uh, in the prison, we are told there are lice and there are ants and there are all sorts of insects. And these two men are in this prison, in a prison, no warm clothes. It is cold and it is in the midnight. And they are having a lot of wounds around their body parts. And they are fit and their hands are in a fixed place so they can't, if they feel an itch, they can't use their hands to do anything. They are in deep pain. And the obvious things that we would expect from uh, such an environment is that they would just lament and cry to God, God, why have you forsaken us? Why are we in this situation? That is the kind of uh, thinking that an ordinary man would be. But funny enough, we are told in verse number 25, in the midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I have a question to you and me today. After going through physical abuse, after going verbal abuse, after feeling forsaken by God, do you have room to pray? Do you have room to sing praises unto God? Most of us, I'm sure, from our theme verse, we would be weary because God has, forsa God has forsaken us. And many a times, 
when we face temptations and trials, that we leave the throne room of grace thinking, if I am a Christian, why would God permit me to go through all this suffering, all this sorrow, and all this pain? Well, I am here to encourage you and me. That, like Paul encourages us in, in Galatians chapter 6-9, do not be weary in doing good, for in due season we will be rewarded. Something of interest to me to, uh, from, from Galatians chapter 6, 9 is it uses the word seasons. It, seasons don't, are not permanent. Seasons are always changing. We have summer, we have winter, we have springtime. And the changing of seasons, it simply means Everything is never permanent. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter, uh, chapter 3 says there's a time for everything. But that should not change our, uh, our, 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 our devotion. That should not change our, our, our faith and trust in, 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 in God. And the Bible says they sang so much that the prisoners yet them. Verse number 26 now says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bends were loosed. Well, friends and uh, relatives or family, I want to ask of you, anything that you do, it is of consequence anything. Let me repeat that way. Anything that you do, it is of consequence to those that look up to you. Well, some of you may ask, so what is this to do with not being weary? Remember, if you read the whole chapter, six, the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, the main purpose of... Um, Paul and Silas being in this particular city was to spread the gospel, right? And I'm also sure you will agree with me that them being beaten and them being verbally abused and them being thrown in prison, it, in a way it was deterring them from the main purpose of of them being in this particular city, which was spreading the gospel. But unknown to them, that no, they were going to do a greater gospel project than they had anticipated. So when they were thrown into jail, they are in so much pain and agony, and I can visualize Paul and Silas, maybe they were talking. So what do we do? That is, if it was today's dinner, they would ask themselves, so what do we do? We don't have our phones. We want to share these verses. And they are probably at the end of their thinking and their planning. And probably Salah is saying, there's no network coverage in this particular, in this particular cell. And actually, we don't have airtime. Those are the excuses that they would have given had it been in this, our generation. But they laid aside all the pain. They laid aside all their worries. They laid aside all their problems. And they sang and prayed and praised God in prison. Not only were they singing in their hearts, there's something that is interesting about Paul and Silas. If it was me, I was going to whisper, so that no one can hear my, my prayer. But they publicized. And they praised God that even if we were going through hardships and problems, they even made it so loud that other prisoners paid attention to what they were doing. This morning, uh, our thought is that as Christians, our lives should be lived so loud enough that everyone that we meet is able to hear that we are living a life that is holy. Let me challenge you this morning. If you are going through hardship, supposedly you are not employed, are you also complaining like everyone else? 
Or are you praising God that through your unemployment, many may see Christ? Well, Paul and Silas sang and prayed. This is totally directly opposite to what is supposed to happen to somebody who is in pain. When you are in pain, the expectation is you are crying and moaning. But these two men are praying and praising or singing praises to God. So in other words, the problems that we are facing today should not take our focus away from the mission, which is to spread the gospel through prayer and singing. In simple terms, do not be weary in doing good. Doing good is not giving people food. Doing good is not giving people shelter, but doing good is making sure that everyone who is around you sees Christ in what you do. Well, I want to ask those uh, that are employed. Do your workmates know that you are a Christian? Do your workmates know that you are not only a Christian, but a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? But not only that, let's bring it down. Do your family members believe in the God that you purport to live for? Do your relatives understand or do they even have the desire to try and know the kind of God that you serve? It's up to you to decide this morning. If you want to live for Christ, it's up to you this morning. If you want people to see Christ in everything that you do, it doesn't matter bad or good happening to you. The Bible is saying, do not be weary in doing good, for in due season you shall be rewarded. Um, there's something that I just want to share before, uh, before I close. Um, in reunion, the group, the music group that I sing with, uh, there is uh, one of our founding members, uh, Ndabangwenye. He is a very smart guy, smart as in dressing, even smart as in thinking. But um, when we usually have programs, everyone was unable to tie a knot of their own neckties. So we would bring, we would come to the program with our ties in our pockets, and we would ask him to tie these, uh, to, 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 to put on our ties for us or to make the notes for, for our ties. And we would always ask him, so how do we do this? And he would always give us instructions to try and help us, but still none of us was able to, 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 to put on the ties the way he, we would love to, you know. So um, one day I did not ask him. I just gave him my tie and looked at him as he was tying the tie. And I was saying, I, I made sure that I see every move that he was making in putting on that tie. And today, he now asks me to tie the knot for him because I'm now doing it better than him. And simple, I'm just saying, the world is no longer in need of Christians who gives them instructions. The world is in need of a Christian who is able to demonstrate of how to be Christ-like. In a world where people have become so discouraged, in a world where a lot of people's hearts have become so heartbroken and devastated, the world is looking for Christians who are able to sing and pray and give praises to God even though they are going through pain. So that in due season, the rewards that are expected can be reaped. Well, my last illustration is if you want to sell avocados or if you want to get into a business of avocados, you need to plant avocado trees. Oh, let me repeat that one. If you want to sell avocados, 
you need to plant avocado trees. As such, if you plant avocado trees and you go and make an advertising, an advertisement in the newspaper, you don't say we will have mangoes at the end of the season. Because the expectation is because you have planted avocado trees at your place, you are expecting avocados, not mangoes. If you are going to get mangoes, you need to also plant mango trees. So when we see you having a mango advertisement, it simply means there's something wrong with the trees that you've planted or there's something wrong with you. The expectation is in due season we are going to reap. But the Bible says, if you read, read Galatians, it says, do not be fooled. Whatsoever, um, do not be fooled or do not be mocked, for God is, should not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, so shall he, so shall he reap. So if you are expecting to reap good rewards or big rewards, you should also be in the field planting big things. Well, the Bible then now tells us in verse number 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. The purpose of the gospel is to free people from the bondage of sin. It's so unfortunate that many Christians today are preaching the gospel of prosperity. Well, it's fine. But that's not the purpose, the sole purpose of the gospel. The sole purpose of the gospel is for people to be freed from the bondage of sin. Is for people to be freed from the problem of sin. So when you as a Christian are living your life and people are not being freed around your community, around your vicinity, it means you have failed. For the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 18 that we should go therefore and preach this word unto every nation, tongue, and tribe. As such, we as Christians should never be weary until we have reached the purposes and the, and the goals of the gospel. The Bible tells us in verse number 26 that there was an earthquake. And this earthquake was so much big and so much loud that the doors of the prison went wide open. If it was today and Shukurubi doors just spring open, we know what would happen. Everyone would run away. But the Bible tells us that when the jailer heard that the doors were open and the people's hands were loosed, he went and took a knife and tried to kill himself. But Paul shouts and says, do not harm yourself. For we are all in here. Well, the purpose of the gospel is for many to see Christ. There were not two services in this prison, but just one. One service by two well beaten. <laughs> I will laugh to that one. Two well-beaten Christians, two verbally abused Christians. And everyone in that prison repented. You don't have to repeat. <laughs> you don't have to repeat songs. You don't have to repeat verses. You don't have to repeat programs. You don't have to replay. You don't have to redo things. Just two spirit-filled Christians who have mission at heart. They can sing so good, so great, that chains are broken. 
Not only chains, doors are opened. Not only that, prisoners are so tamed that they can only but sit and want to continue to listen to these men. Well, that's what good music can do. If you can play good music, it can tame a wild child into a Christ-loving child. If you listen and play good music, it can tame the wildest and the vilest of sinners and the violent of husbands and the violent, the most abusive person can become so timid and peaceful. Only if we do not get weary. Well, when I was young, I tried singing and nobody would listen to what I want to sing. I remember a particular day, my dad bought a CD by Vocal Union and you know, Vocal Union is one of the greatest a cappella musical groups in the world. And I would sit with my ear right next to the speaker. And obviously I was trying to, you know, <laughs> sing along to these guys that are in the radio. And my dad would say, hey, 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 go outside. You can't sing. You can't sing at all. <laughs> and it would really hurt. Because I was, in my mind, I thought I was singing exactly because my ear was very much next to the radio. <laughs> It's not enough just to be a Christian who puts the Bible next to their heart, who puts a Bible next to their head, or who puts a Bible next to their ear when we are not living what's in the Word. Christians will just be Christians. We have no impact when we do that. But when this Word is put in practice. Many will want to hear the kind of God that we serve. Many will want to come and be Christians like us. The Bible tells us that when Paul ensured the jailer that they were all still inside the prison, he said, so, what must I do? <laughs> what must I do? Until such a question is asked about your singing, until such a question is asked about your lifestyle, until your dressing has rendered other people to ask, so what must I do to be like you? Then we haven't studied my fellow friends and dear Christians, it has become so hard to be Christ-like in a world of selfishness. It has become so hard to save others when you want to save yourself. It has become so hard to try and assist others when you yourself are in need of assistance. It has become so hard for many because they are thinking of themselves, within themselves, to themselves, to think about others. But it is also going to become even harder for you to be saved if you fail to think about others. The long and short of this presentation this morning is we are told the jailer was baptized. We are told not only him, but his wife was baptized. Not only his wife, we are told the children were also baptized. Not only that, even the slaves within his house were baptized. Until such a time when the gospel becomes 
so palatable as such that a member of the family does not want to be saved alone, then we have not started. Many of us think it is just enough for you and your wife to be baptized. It's not enough until the garden boy who saves you at your house is baptized and sees and feels the emptiness that I need to serve the God of my masters. The gospel is not enough until those that we work with try by all means to find out how we have become Christians or how they can become like us. Lastly, we are told Paul and Silas were released from jail. One wonders in the back of their mind what was in the mind of the magistrates who told them to be thrown in prison. One also wonders what happened in the minds of those that had beaten them a day or two before. One wonders what happened to those prisoners they were with in jail. The simple desire of my heart this morning. If we are able as Christians, especially for us, the Seventh-day Adventists, we are known for singing. Yes, the singing is good, but is it powerful enough for people to accept Christ as their personal savior. All I'm asking of you and my appeal to you and me today, let's live a life so unquestionable. Let's live a life so great as such many will see Christ in us. Let us close our eyes and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, no amount of beating should take us away from your cross. No amount of discouragement should take us away from the foot of the cross. No amount of temptation or trial should discourage us from continuing to being good. In a world so filled with selfishness and self-centeredness, Lord, help us today that we become selfless, that many may be brought into your kingdom. For your word encourages us that it is not done by power or by mighty, but by your spirit. So we are praying this morning, Father, that may the Holy Spirit come and make a dwelling in our hearts so much that many may see Christ in the way that we dress, that many may see Christ in the way that we talk, that many may see Christ in our conduct, but more so, that many may see Christ in our teaching. Many may see Christ even in our singing. And when you have done that, may all the glory and honor be retained unto you. Lord, I pray that churches are physically closed, but our hearts are still open unto your salvation. May you save us from wherever we are, some are in bed, some are seated in their, in their homes. Wherever we are, Lord, may your Holy Spirit come and make a dwelling in us as such that we don't become weary in becoming like Christ, that many may be added to your kingdom, but that at the end of it all, may we all be saved into your kingdom. kingdom. I pray all this in the mighty and loving name of Jesus. Amen. On a Sunday afternoon in a small town near the city of Chattanooga, a group gathers for a purse party. We represent Peace of Thread. 
which is um, a local initiative, and it's under the umbrella of ANFA, which is Adventist Muslim Friendship Association. We had a purse party, and it was in somebody's home, and so she invited a lot of her friends from the church that they attend, and then we set up and showed them the purses. Uh, of course, we have a variety. There's no two purses that are alike. We make sure of that. And so every person that buys is going to have something unique and something that is their own. Inside each one of the purses, we have a little tag that tells about the refugee that sewed that purse and a little bit about Amfa. And we ask each lady that buys to be able to pray for that refugee. With the purse party wrapping up, Mona helps Darlene put away the remaining purses. Mona, who arrived as a refugee 11 years ago, is both in leadership at Amfa and a designer for Piece of Thread Chattanooga. We sell a lot of things, a lot of purses, and God bless us with all kind of people that came here. So we're looking forward to the for the next time, next 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 meeting, another uh, another house. Maybe next month we will be at, at my house. Malik, see you tomorrow. During the summer, Amfa has a summer school for Muslim refugee children, helping them to integrate into America in a godly way. At the same time, we started sewing classes for the women. And that's where we started with Piece of Thread, so that they're actually learning to sew, learning to sew purses, and now being able to sell them and make some money. It's Monday, and the women of Piece of Thread Chattanooga are gathering for their weekly sewing class. The sewing class takes place in various church fellowship halls, though someday they hope to have a more permanent location. Nima starts the day off with a quick testimony. The women talk about their week, Darlene talks about the successes of Sunday afternoon, makes some announcements, and after a short prayer, they begin on a new purse design. Part of the whole experience is not just about learning to sew, of course, but it's getting together and getting acquainted with each other and listening to you know, what their needs are and what their experiences are and sharing those with us as leaders with them, but also with each other because so many of these ladies didn't know each other before and so they have sisters that they can call on you know to answer questions and to just share the highs and lows of life. Rhonda, who was a nurse in Sudan before coming to the United States as a refugee, will be starting her studies to become a medical assistant later this year. It's helped me to uh, organize my time first and uh, my boys, they love that too. And I got the machine. They said, oh, mom, we don't have to throw our, our clothes. We can, you can sew it to us. And that's the good things. And I organized my time to, for sewing and do what, teach uh, my, tea, my kids and clean my house and do whatever I want. And first time I don't like to sew, but now I really enjoy sewing. I used to sew in my country. So when I, they add me to the Amfa group, so they, they put me as a like designer. I came here as a like refugee, and now my turn to help a refugee, to help them what they need, what they want, uh, especially the woman. So now they, they have an income every month. So I'm happy when I see them very happy. Well, the, the project's a big blessing to me personally, um, uh, starting off because, you know, we're given talents and uh, it's true that I can, you know, make quilts or make costumes or whatever, but it doesn't have the same joy as doing the sewing project with these ladies. You know, they're excited about learning a new skill that gives them something to do in their spare time and it gives them an opportunity to earn income. And for a couple of these ladies, they've never, never had their own spending money. I love seeing the ladies happy. I love seeing the ladies creating, interacting. We're a, we're a, a community and we share. And you know, this is all for God. Please pray for the relationships being formed through this initiative. Thank you for supporting Mission.
kids channel i hope you had a great week and are ready for our story time i'm auntie jan here to tell you another story about miracles this time we're going to be talking about prophet elisha and the axe head so sit back and listen to our story it starts when the prophet Elisha, who we know, was a student of the prophet Elijah who was taken up to heaven by a whirlwind and a chariot of horses. So our prophet Elisha was now God's anointed prophet in Israel. So prophet Elisha used to talk to other prophets in Israel. And then one day he met with the prophets and the prophet said to him, prophet, the space where we meet with you is too small. Let us build another place close to the Jordan River that is bigger and has more space for us to meet and sit comfortably. So prophet Elisha agreed. Then they insisted that when they were building, he should go down to the river Jordan with them. So they went down together and they started chopping down trees to build their new place. So as they were chopping down the trees, one of the, one of the prophet's axe head became loose. And when it got loose, it flew into the air and fell into the river. Oh no, he cried, my axe! Oh, and he was so sad. This was a borrowed axe. And metal axes are so, so expensive. He was worried because prophets didn't earn a lot of money in those times. So he didn't know how to replace it. Then prophet Elisha said to him, now, 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 calm down. Show me exactly where it fell in the water. So the prophet pointed. He said, right there right there it fell right over there i saw it i saw it i know it was there it couldn't have been anywhere else and then prophet elisha said okay all right i got this then he got a stick and he threw it into the water and we know what does metal do when it gets into water metal sinks all the way down to the bottom so the axe head sank all the way down to the bottom, which is why the prophet needed to point because the, the metal part wasn't floating. So when the prophet Elisha threw his stick into the water, can you guess what happened to the axe head? Anybody? Can you guess? Can you guess? Do you think that maybe the axe head um, started blowing bubbles to show people where it was? You know, like how people just blow bubbles when they're underwater? Or do you think the axe head floated? Floating? Hmm. The axe head actually floated. Ah, oh, how does metal float? 
Oh my goodness, that was so amazing. Then the prophet Elisha said, go ahead, lift it out, take it out of the water. And the prophet went on and he lifted out the axe head and he put it back on his stick. Amazing stuff. Now, this could only have been a miracle, a miracle from God. Remember, when the prophet Elijah was taken up or before he was taken up, he asked Elisha, what would you have God do for you? Elisha said, I would like a double portion of God's grace upon my life. And the double portion he sure got to make a metal float. Those can only be the miracles of God. So boys and girls, be good children. Remember to say your prayers and talk to God always in prayer. Have a great time. Bye.
we want to thank God who has given it given each of us yet another day to to be alive we want to thank God he has seen us to this point even on this very day when we worship him we want to thank him because he has been so good to each and every one of us we want to welcome those who are joining us through this online worship at Mount Pleasant Church. Thank you for making time to be with us. And this morning we want to continue with our theme of not being weary. Our theme is weary not. Before we start to consider scripture for today, that we have for this hour, we want to pause for a moment and pray. Shall we? Bow our heads, close our eyes as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, thank you, dear God, for being merciful and gracious to each of us, that at this point in time we can be listening to your word, which is there for us, that we might be able to be drawn closer to the foot of the cross, wherein we are able to find purpose, of our life, wherein we are able to find rescue from those things that drain us, wherein we are able to find success in this life, even in our spiritual lives. Dear God, as we are going to go through your word, we pray that your spirit may descend upon each and every one of us as we worship together, that he may guide each of us unto all truths, and accordingly, Lord, that at the end of this service we are able to say, indeed, we have been with the Lord. May you pour your spirit in great measure that indeed today we are able to say, indeed, Christ has saved us. For we have prayed through Jesus who died for us on the cross so that we could have life in him. Amen. We want to continue with our theme uh, Weary not, which I think from morning we were talking about. And I think as we are considering in the morning, we looked at different portions of scripture on the same topic. And we continue on the same, looking at other portions of scripture as we consider the same theme. I think it is very clear that in our time as we are here, many of us, if not all of us, are affected or perhaps unfortunately infected by the pandemic which has so far engrossed the world. And this pandemic of COVID-19 has been so much impactful that it has even upset different economies across the world. It has not only affected the economies that are third world, but even first world economies have been affected. We have seen that the world has come together to try and see how it can get rescue from this pandemic. And as we consider our situation, we also notice that some of us have perhaps been infected by this particular uh, disease and the virus has attacked us, and some of us have a testimony of how difficult it could have been when we suffered the effects of COVID. I would also want to take this opportunity to also say, unfortunately, in some instances, we have also suffered deaths that have come because of COVID. Some of us have had family that have departed when they made the demise of COVID. Some of us could have at this point in time, heard of relatives that have passed away because of COVID. Some of us could have friends who have also suffered the demise of death in their families because of this particular disease. And now I pray that dear God, the God that we worship, can come and comfort each of us that has been affected. And to those we have been infected. We pray God continues to grant us good health. There may also be others that are at this point in time as I speak, 
already infected and are suffering the challenges of COVID. And now I pray dear, that God can come to our rescue, each of us and heal us. Some of us, because of the responses to this, to the impact of this particular pandemic, where economies have been locked down and most jobs have been lost, have had challenges uh, visiting their homes and we have found ourselves without perhaps food to eat. And now I pray God can visit us and rescue us. Some of us, even in this time, we have also continued to suffer. Even the very old challenge of sin. And now I pray God can visit us and forgive us. In the same vein, some of us could have suffered. That because of the change of our circumstance, we are not able to minister the word of God in the usual way. But how I pray that God can give and minister to each of us of new ways to continue ministering in his vineyard. Some of us could have been working for the Lord and because of the challenges we are facing and we're faced, we are beginning to weary, we are beginning to get tired, we are beginning to get fatigued, we are beginning to think we just need to drop this mission. But how I pray this morning that we may keep courage that we need to continue in the work of the Lord. Let's not weary at this point in time because as we see the experience of now that we have, it is a sign that the coming of the Lord is much nearer than when we first believed. And now I pray that we might take comfort that despite the challenges that we are facing, we are able to continue holding on to our master, Jesus Christ. As we begin to consider the word of God, as we open scripture, we start from a very familiar text. And today, our discourse is not very difficult. It's very simple, but it's going to be, the one, to be one that is going to encourage us in our time. John 3, 16, we all perhaps can recite of head. It says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as we consider that particular text of scripture, it is very deep in terms of our salvation. It is the center of our salvation. And what do I mean by that? It is a text of scripture which tells us what God has ultimately done to save us, that he has given us Jesus Christ so that if we have only believed, then we can be saved and have eternal life. And why is that important? Because when sin came, it meant that we were facing death and God gave a provision that for us to escape death, we should believe in Christ and he can give us life eternal. And again, as we look at this particular text, secondly, it also brings us to a point of decision-making, a point of making a choice. Because it says, if one believes, then they have eternal life. The flip side is, therefore, if one does not believe, they therefore don't have eternal life. So it's incumbent upon each of us to make a call, a choice, at this point in time, when time is still with us, how ought we to respond to this magnificent gift that God gave us through Christ so that we could have life eternal? And as we consider ourselves as we live in this time and in this age, we need to note that the question that continues to come to each of us is... Are we going to follow Christ or are we not going to follow Christ? And this is what John 3.16 challenges us to, to consider. And, and, and if we look at the blessing that comes from following Christ, there is life eternal that's given as a gift. 
that when we've believed in Christ, then we have life eternal. But then someone is going to ask me, but what do you mean? As we look in our lives, we have death ravaging our lives. We have lost loved ones. Some who even believed, and we know they believed God. So what does this mean, that we have life eternal? And we look at that particular text of scripture. It goes beyond this death that we are suffering here on earth, which is actually termed by Christ sleep at some point. Even Paul classifies this as sleep because after that sleep, there is something that comes after. And I'd want us to, to walk through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, uh, so that we can see what scripture is for us. Let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, reading verses 13 to 18. And there's, there are key promises that I want us to take note of, which when we master, I do pray that they give us courage to continue, to continue holding on to Christ. We shouldn't weary because there is death that visits us here on earth. Because there's a promise that even this particular death will pass away when his resurrection visits us. Let's consider verse 18. It reads, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15. For this say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those that have been risen in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be with the Lord. Lord, therefore, comfort one another with these words. This particular uh, portion of scripture gives hope because verse 18 says, comfort one another with these words. Which words? The words that this death that we suffer, this death that we're experiencing here on earth is a time that it will end. And it has been classified by scripture here that it is actually sleep. And as we know, the reason it is classified as sleep is because after sleep, one arises. Therefore, we also get qualification in terms of how we are to, to participate in the enjoyment of rising after this sleep. The first part, it says, those that have slept in Jesus, those that have died in the arms of Jesus, those that have believed, those that have chosen to follow the precepts of John 3.16, to believe in God so that they have eternal life. Those ones who have died, whether they've died of COVID or any other disease, they will arise when Christ comes. Because when Christ comes, he's going to resurrect those who have slept in him. So, Lesson number one, those that sleep can choose to sleep in Jesus when they have believed before they have slept. They cannot choose to be in Jesus when they have slept. They choose to be in Jesus before they have slept. So as I speak this morning, I admonish us to make a choice. John 3, 16, let's believe in Christ so that we can have life eternal. And why does John 3.16 say that you're going to have life eternal? It's because the experience of death 
is but an episode that will pass when you have believed, because we know there's going to be a resurrection. And why do we believe there's going to be a resurrection? Because we believe in Christ. We believe he lived, he died, and he rose. So he resurrected. And when he comes again, he's going to resurrect those that have slept in him. And at the point of his coming, it won't be those only who have believed and slept who will meet up with him. Those who are alive and again are believing in Christ will too be caught up when he comes in the clouds to meet with the Lord so that they can meet their loved ones who slept in Christ who have now been resurrected. Therefore, because death has a solution, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, we are comforting one another that those of our relatives, those of our family members, those of our friends, those of our workmates who have slept in the arms of Jesus, we will be able to meet with them at resurrection morning if we too would have chosen to be in Christ. It doesn't matter. We could have joined them in sleep. By the time Christ comes, we will also resurrect. If we are alive when he comes, we will be caught up when the dead in Christ have been resurrected and Christ gives us life everlasting, which is promised in John 3, 16. That's why I said that text is so deep for our salvation because it is the hope that we will live forever with Christ. Despite this episode, we suffer on earth of death. Why am I sharing this particular portion of scripture? We might be weary. We have lost loved ones. We have lost family members. I know as I'm speaking, some have lost their parents. Some have lost their children. Some have lost their grannies. Some have lost their friends, best of friends. But hear me this morning as we consider this text. Let's consider to choose Christ because in choosing Christ, there is a hope after death. This death, this death that we have here on earth. And, and as we consider this particular text of scripture, one, one can then say, okay, how do I live in this world which is full of all pressures from all sides, such that I continue with this commitment of continual living in the Lord because I've chosen to follow him. And let's consider Galatians chapter 6, uh, reading from verse 7 to 10. What ought we to be doing? What ought we to be doing as we continue to live here on earth if we are still alive? And if we go to the book of Galatians chapter 6, it was shared already in the morning. But I'll just touch a few aspects just to buttress what has already been shared. Verse 7 of Galatians chapter 6 reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. So Galatians 6 comes to tell us, okay, we've chosen Christ as our personal savior. We choose to want to live by the precepts of Christ. How ought we to live? And the substance of our living, the style of our life is evidenced or is given in Galatians chapter 6. 
that we need to continuously do good, not to a few men, but to all men, number one. Number two, especially those who are of the household of faith, those we share the same faith with. But let's take note, it doesn't say exclusively <laughs> those of the household of faith, but it says especially. It doesn't say exclusively. It means we have to be sharing goodness with all men and to prioritize those of the house of faith. How do we do this? We should understand that as we live, Christ came down to demonstrate how we ought to live. And if you look at the life of Christ, the substance of his life was interacting with those who were less privileged, the orphans, the widows, and those that were in need, ensuring that they had an uplift of their life. I know some of us could be doing the same at this point in time, helping the needy, looking after the elderly, making sure that they prioritize the health and prioritize the shelter of widows. Do not weary. Continue doing the good thing. Because Galatians is saying, this is what, is what we ought to do. Because verse 7 says, God is not mocked. Let's not be deceived. What we are, saw, what we are sowing is what we are going to reap. If we don't do good, we are going to reap no good. If we are going to sow good, so shall we reap good. Let's not think there is another formula. The Bible is making it clear that as we have believed in Christ, we ought to do good unto all men. And it also says and qualifies, in case some may wonder, what is to, to, to sow in one's flesh, as verse 8 uh, uh, puts it across. If you are sowing in your own flesh, it means you are self-centered. You are so selfish that you just want to increase the abundance of what you have. Forgetting the needs of those that are around you. Never sharing with anyone to the very extent that you won't even visit those who are in need. You won't even be able to give those that need. But if we saw to the Spirit the spirit of Christ, which was the spirit of God, which is the spirit of giving, we will be able to bear each other's burdens despite what they are. It could be poverty. It could be need for fees. It could be need for counseling. It could be need for anything. We will be able to share because we are sowing the, to the spirit, which is the spirit of Christ. And when we do, what we will reap is goodness, which is then evidenced in everlasting life. Let's continue remembering John 3, 16. And then when we've considered all this, one is going to ask, okay, why are we having to do good? Is that all that a Christian must do? Come with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 we will consider verses 31 to the last, 44. Common text of scripture. But it is full of meaning that we need to consider this morning. Verse 31 of Matthew 25. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now we remember from Thessalonians that Christ is going to come and is going to resurrect those who have slept in him to everlasting life. This is the same that's being described here. But we hear in Thessalonians, it says he will come with the clouds. But here in Matthew, it says he will come with the holy angels so one can see. Thessalonians, the clouds that it referred to were the holy angels that accompanied Christ at his coming. 
So there will be glory that fills this event of his coming. And verse 32 says, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from goats. So when Christ comes, he is separating those that follow him and those that don't follow him. Those that follow him here represented by sheep and those that don't follow him represented by goats. We remember when he comes in Thessalonians, it says those who have slept in Jesus will be resurrected to life everlasting. Those who are living at that point following Christ will also be caught up with those that have been resurrected who slept in Christ so that they can be with the Lord to everlasting. Those are the sheep that Christ comes to take home. Verse 33 says, And he will set the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then, verse 34, Then the king shall say to those on the right, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the very foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came in. You came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we, when did we see you a stranger and we took you in? Or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, as much as you did it to the least of these my, my, these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you, cur you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you didn't give me food. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we did not minister to you? Then he will answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did, as you did not do it to what, to at the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So Matthew is now buttressing Galatians chapter 6. By doing good, by doing good, Christ is already telling us we become the sheep that he will come for. By not doing good, we become gods and we have seen what the ending will be. The sheep to everlasting life the goats to everlasting punishment. So as we consider John 3.16, let's make a choice. It's a point of making a decision. If we believe in God, we become his sheep and we receive eternal life. Despite the challenges we might face, despite the burdens we might suffer, including the death here on earth, as it is an episode that will be passed as Christ comes to take his home. And as we consider as well, it will be regrettable, it will be so sad that we'll be found as goats because we did not do good unto men. We were sowing to ourselves. We were feeding selfishness. We were feeding self-abundance and forgot about others. How ought we to look to every corner of our lives, in our family as we start, is, are the members of our family well fed as we are also fed? Do they have resources as we also have resources? And we go out to our friends, to the community, and to the less needy. God is looking for people that are going to exemplify Christ 
in the reality of how they live, in the verity of what they do in their lives, which is doing good. That's what Christ did, and that's who Christ was. Christ was well known for doing good. Yes, he was also known for speaking good, but more so for doing good. So at this point in time, as I said, it really will be shameful that we become goats and then we have everlasting punishment. And this everlasting punishment, verse 44 says, it's everlasting fire. But this everlasting fire was never prepared for us. It was prepared for the devil, the devil and his angels. How would we choose to participate in such? We have a choice, friends, as we are listening to this discourse this morning. To choose Christ, and then we are saved. Whether we are going to die, whether we are going to get sick, whether we are going to suffer any affliction, God has already promised, as Matthew 25 is depicting, that as long we remain sheep in him, we will, at his coming, receive life everlasting. So let's not be weary. We can be ministering and are beginning to get tired. This morning I admonish, rekindle yourself. And I'm going to talk shortly as to how we rekindle ourselves that we get the energy that we need to continue the walk of faith so that as he comes, whether we're dead or alive, it matters not. What matters is that if we're dead, we died in Christ. If we're alive, we're alive in Christ. Then we will be caught up at the resurrection morning. So this morning, friends, admonish us to not get weary. But one can say, but how do I not get weary? Because things are tough. Come with me to Galatians 2, verse 20. Come with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20 reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, if you look at Galatians 2.20, it's telling us that when we are in Christ Jesus, we begin to live the life of Christ. It is no longer us that live, but Christ living in us. So the very power we want to be able to continue doing good, we get it through Christ who is living in us. Because Christ living in us is able to make us continue the walk of faith. That's our strength. That's our secret. When we're getting uh, to be burdened by this life, when we're getting wearied, when we're getting tired, let's go back to Christ. Because Christ living in us, our hope and the author and the finisher of our faith gives us ability, capacity to continue walking the faith that should we meet the demise of death here on earth, we sleep in his arms, awaiting resurrection. That if we should not sleep before he has come, we will be ready to be changed at his coming so that we receive eternal life. So let's not get weary. This is the secret. Remaining in Christ, whom we have believed, that his life becomes our life. His life takes charge of our lives, then we are able to do good unto all men. As you reflect on this particular point, you recognize that therefore the goodness that we so do is not coming from us, but coming from Christ who is living in us. And Christ is the center and the reason why we are able to do good. Long and short, Let's remain in the arms of the master each day through studying his word, 
through reading, uh, through praying, and ministering for him. As we do those three, we will be able to remain in the arms of Christ. And this good that we talk about, it's not an ethos that comes from man. It comes from the very heart of God. You remember when Christ met the a rich young ruler who said, Master, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Christ said, there's none good but who? God. So, when we're talking good, we're talking the very presence, the very essence of God in our lives. We're not talking goodness as we might measure it as man, but we're talking good from a godly point of view. Therefore, we cannot generate it from ourselves. Therefore, hence the reason why Galatians 2, uh, 20, 20 is saying, Christ living in us becomes our life so that we reflect the goodness of God because it doesn't come from us. That's what keeps us in faith. That's what makes us continue to walk this life despite the challenges we're going to face. Matthew 24 already told us there's going to be so many challenges we're going to, to meet. Wars, pestilences, diseases, pandemics, and all those, those kind. But we'll be able to sail through to realize the goal of eternal life, whether alive it is coming or dead when he has come, as long we remain in Jesus. That's our hope. Someone might say, ah, how come, how, how does Christ give me the ability to continue to live and not get weary? And I have the following text to share with us, which is going to tell us how we can continue in this walk of faith despite the challenges we face. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. We'll consider verses uh, 25 to 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 to 31. Verse 25 reads, To whom, this is God speaking, to whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One. Verse 26. Let up your eyes on high. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number. He calls them by name. By the greatest greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you, O Jacob, and O Israel, sorry, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over, by God. Verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. 29. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings 
like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So Isaiah introduces God as God says, uh, who do you liken me to? And the reason why God is saying this is so that we can understand who he is. You know, our world would say someone is bringing across their curricular vitae, a CV, to say who they are. So God is saying, when you look around, who can you equal me to? I, equal, I am equal to no one. I am above everybody that you can think of. I'm above everything that you can think of. And when he says so, he then goes on to say, look at the creation that I've made. The things that I've created are so many and vast. Look up and check. And I think if you look in the sky, we'll see the galaxy of stars. And he says of them, they are numbered. So they are not just a counted figure of objects that God has created, but they are numbered. They have a number. They have a name. They have a title to them. Like we can say this star that we see which lights up earth, sun. We actually give it a name. They are known. That's how mighty God is. And there are billions of them. And God is saying, when you look at that, that's what I created. So who can you equal me to? God is making sure that we understand who he is and we can understand what he is standing on when he then says, I give strength to the weak. He goes on to say, why, Israel, do you say your ways are hidden from the Lord? Yet I have created this vastness of universe. And why do you even complain and say, I I, 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 I pass uh, the just claim you have. God is saying there is nothing that's hidden from me because I am God. So when you should suffer, I am your God because I give strength to the weary. And he says, I am not like you. I don't faint, neither do I get weary. Therefore, you can trust me when it comes to non-fainting, when it comes to not getting weary, you can indeed trust me. Not, not only because of that, but because I am a creator of this magnificent universe that we have spoken of. And because of that, and because I don't faint, and I don't get weary, I am the one, the source of the weak that I give them strength. Those that are weak, I give them power. Those that lack might, I give them and increase their strength. Why? So that they don't faint and don't get weary. And one could say, but it doesn't affect the young people. But Isaiah is saying, even the youths can faint and can get weary and can utterly fall. But God is saying, I am available to ensure that I give you power to avoid fainting. I give you power to avoid getting weary. So as we're well looking at our discourse this morning, weary not. We weary not because God has given us strength. We weary not because Christ is living in us. We weary not because Christ continues to do good in us and outward we also show goodness to others because he is the source of our strength. And he says, should you be weary? Verse 31, come and wait upon me for I will, give, I will renew your strength. You might be faint, you might be weary, but there's no loss of hope. You can still go back to the Lord. I can still go back to the Lord, even though I may have fallen utterly. God is saying in that utterness, 
of falling, I am able to pick you up and give you strength again so that you may not be weary, but that you can actually fly with wings like eagle, eagles to be able to continue doing good unto others, to continue walking the walk of faith. You will actually run like athletes and not get weary because I give the strength. You will actually be able to even walk but not faint. Why? Because I, the Lord, will be your source of strength. I will replenish as you come for renewal. I will replenish that strength that you have so that you weary not. So friends, as we come to sum up what we've studied this morning, let's remember the key question was, are we going to choose God or are we not going to choose God? Because God so loved us that he gave us Christ that whosoever believes in this Christ that he has given us will have everlasting life. And then we went on to, to, to check then how ought we to live. We noticed we need to continue doing good to all men. And then we asked ourselves, but how can we be able to do good to all men? We suffer affliction. We suffer trouble. We suffer persecution. We even suffer death here on earth. But we realized if we are living a life in Christ, we are able to be sustained in doing good because the source of our goodness we do to others is coming from Christ himself. When we went to Isaiah, it was very clear that God is ready to give strength to those that will come to him for a renewal and will mount up with wings as eagles and be able to fly to continue without weary. Not because we are any special, but because God is giving us a renewal. God is living in our hearts. And as we continue to have that relationship with Christ, we noted we will continue to do his work and we will continue to do good. Qualified as ensuring that we do good to everybody. The least that we may consider least in this world when we continue doing good to them. And as we continue to visit those that are afflicted and comfort them, those who are bereaved and comfort them, then are we doing the work of the Lord as true religion. Yes, we can speak of it, but as we live, we are able to demonstrate, as we live doing good, we are then able to demonstrate Christ fully to the, to, to the world around us. And so will the world have a moment to stop and think and make a choice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have life eternal. And as I close, just want to read this particular passage coming from review uh, 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 review heralds uh, of uh, August 16, 18, 81. Uh, part two of it, it reads, to be a patient toiler in that which calls for self-denying labor is a glorious work that heavens smiles upon. Faithful work is more acceptable to God than the most zealous thought to be holiest of worship. True worship consists in working together with Christ. True worship consists in working together with Christ. I do at this point ask the Lord to bless each of us and to add a blessing to the reading of his word as we come to a close. And before I sit, I'll want us to 
take a moment as we pray. Then we're going to sing a song before we end service. Shall we close our eyes, bow our heads as we pray? Our Father, what in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for your word. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you, dear God, for your instruction. We thank you, God, for your generosity. We thank you, God, for your providence. We also thank you, dear God, for your presence in our lives to be able to give us strength even though we weary, even though we faint sometimes, even though we utterly fall at some points, lift us up, dear God, by your power, that we may continue to follow thee. I pray, dear God, at this point, that may each of us make a choice to follow Jesus, so that we can have life everlasting when he shall come. We have also noted in Thessalonians, that doesn't matter whether they were dead or alive. The ultimate will be that we will meet you because you are going to resurrect those that have slept in you or died in you. Or you are going to change us to be like you at your coming if we are alive so that we are caught up together to be with you forevermore. How I pray, dear God, that this very day, each person can make a choice for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Bless us and continue to look after us. For we've prayed through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. At this point in time, we'd want to consider singing um, 202 um, in closing, if we may, as we close. Um, I worship Jesus, Savior, pilot me. We are singing this because we want to acknowledge that God, through Christ, is the one who pilots us. Through all the treacherous sea that we might, we might face in life, even though the oceans may be wild before us, in various forms, we still can remain faithful to the end and not get weary. Weary not, save, uh, the, the saint, we do not, as you continue holding on to Christ, our Savior. So we'll sing that in closing. Jesus, Savior, pilot me All oh, the life's tempest you see And on waves before me roll Hiding rock and treacherous shore, chart and compass come from thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me as a mother stings a child. Thou hast hushed the ocean wild, boisterous waves. Obey thy will when thou sayest to them, be still. Wondrous soaring of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me when at last I need a shore and the faithful breakers roll. Then while leaning on thy breast, may I hear thee say to me, Fear not, I will pilot thee. May God bless you.